All right, so let's get into actual topics of what we're gonna be talking about today. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is what type of skills do you actually need to be marketable in the embedded systems world? Uh, and then after that, we'll go into an intro to data-oriented design for embedded systems. So I'll talk about the origins of, the, of uh, the design practice, the theory, so the thought process behind it, and then actual real practical examples. We'll look at some real code, uh, real design for embedded and video game applications. All right, so let's look at some marketable skills. So where, where to begin here? So first of all, let's define what embedded systems is, at least in this talk, because this is really important to understand. So embedded systems I'm talking about are custom printed circuit board assemblies with microprocessors, microcontrollers that have peripherals with I.O. that control some external form of hardware or uh, some type of system. And you can apply embedded systems to a number of different things, but that's what we're gonna be talking about particularly today. Uh, that being said, it's a very esoteric field. There's a very small amount of people who choose to go into this field, but there's a ton of knowledge uh, encompassing this field. Uh, so, with that being said, as the world is moving uh, smaller and smaller nowadays, there's abundant job opportunities available to you, but it doesn't come without consequence. It's a stressful career at times, but it's challenging and has novel, or novel problems. And this is something that you want to get into if you're interested in being on the bleeding edge of, of, of technology. And, and at that point, it's exciting, at least to me, because it means you get to be on the forefront of development. There's endless applications, especially now, especially talking about Internet of Things, using the cloud interfacing to sensors and creating a whole distributed system. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. The way I like to describe embedded systems is would you rather use technology or invent it? Would you rather use the STL or Boost library to do some C++ programming or do you actually want to invent some of those libraries yourself? So where are embedded systems? And the answer to that is everywhere. I mean, this little pointer remote probably has a microcontroller in it. All these projectors have it in it. You have some in your pockets. Phones, stoves, planes, cars, trains, pretty much within an arm's reach, you're gonna see something with an embedded system. Now the future is really where it gets exciting. This is what Internet of Things. A lot of different applications where you can communicate through the internet with distributed systems and things like that. So these problems are still relevant today as they were 20 or 30 years ago. The design challenges are still similar. Uh, you just have different stack ups in, in, when you're communicating over the internet. So what are you focused in? So this is pretty, pretty important to understand. Uh, so hardware versus software, embedded's a bit of both. Uh, you can't really, you kind of have to straddle the line between hardware and software. Uh, it can't really be one or the other. You kind of have to have knowledge of both. Whether you're designing a circuit that interfaces with software from a microcontroller, you need to understand what those timings are gonna be like and how that works, and vice versa. You need to understand the hardware if you're programming because you need to be able to control those signals correctly and make sure your system's within the right tolerances. So with that being said, you can really go into two areas of focus. Uh, there's embedded hardware, so you can do discrete circuit design, things like resistors, capacitors, inductors, whatever, what have you, MOSFETs, uh, that connect to the microcontroller that the software then controls, so you can focus on that area, or you can get into digital design, things like hardware description languages and logic design, uh, discrete logic design, all this stuff still exists and is very, very heavily active today. Or you can go into embedded software, this is where you start touching things like microcontrollers. So you're programming uh, microcontrollers to uh, control different I.O. scenarios, talk serially to, uh, from one thing to another, or you can even do custom embedded computing. This is where something like, uh, if you work at NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, all these uh, you know, motherboards and processors that communicate back and forth, this is the type of stuff you'd be writing. So what are we focused on today? Well, I want to talk about embedded software, specifically microcontrollers, as we can see this little PIC microcontroller on the screen here. So what skills are you going to need if you want to enter into this field? And what do employers typically look for? Now, this is going to be stuff I typically look for. This isn't going to be something my employer typically looks for. This is just things I look for when I look for, uh, for new engineers. So how can I be more marketable uh, as an embedded engineer? You have to have solid embedded fundamentals. So do you know the basics? Do you know what serial communication is? Do you know what pulse width modulation is? I mean, uh, do you know what GPIO is, general purpose input output? Um, and have you played around with embedded projects before? This is huge. If you're not interested in it, how can you expect to get a job in it? Especially with something this complicated and esoteric, it's not really a straightforward or drop-in type of position. And are you passionate about it? Do you care about it? Like I said, it's a field that has a lot of challenging and novel problems, and it's, it can be stressful at times. Are you willing to push through the hard parts of the design in order to get to the finish line? 
positive attitude. This is something that's really underrated in terms of engineering in general. Uh, so you want to have a passion towards the field and its unique challenges. Things are going to change. Uh, design challenges are going to pop up. It's important to keep a positive attitude and keep yourself on track. And finally, do you have the technical know-how to solve these problems? I'm willing to overlook some of this if this encompasses more, because everybody can always learn. But you need some basic knowledge, and I'll kind of go over what, what I typically look for. Uh, and this is usually done through a technical assessment in an interview. So how well do you know the typical tools of the job? Every job that's posted is going to have a set of tools that you need to know how to interface with, because that's what the job requires. And there's going to be questions revolving around those. And can you implement a design? So now you have all this knowledge floating around in your brain of how to use these tools and all the embedded systems, but how can you actually put that on paper and implement something that works? And can you use engineering analysis to solve a problem? Things like signal processing, uh, statistics and probability, all these things come up in embedded systems and you need to know how to apply them to real world situations. And can you solve the problem at the end of the day? All right, so let's talk about the solid fundamentals a little bit more detailed. Let's go basic knowledge some design understanding, some knowledge of the hardware, tools. All right, so basic knowledge really goes a long way here. Uh, can you read a data sheet? This is really important. Uh, in embedded systems, hardware changes every few months or so. So this means that as your designs progress, you need to be able to ascertain the important things about a data sheet, the pros and the cons, how it fits into your system as a whole, and be able to implement that so you can see how things behave. Do you know what interrupts are? So this is something that is like the fu fun fundamental principle of embedded computing is a signal for an interrupt. I'm not talking about software interrupts, I'm talking about hardware interrupts, real, real lines here. Do you know what serial protocols are? Everything in embedded systems communicates with one another nowadays. You need to know things like UART, I squared C, SPY, all these different protocols, and you need to know how, when, how and when to use them and if it applies to your design. These are all tools to solve the problem. You're not hired a job for an embedded job to do code. You're hired to solve a problem. Code is the tool to solve the problem, and so are these protocols and hardware. You need to keep that in mind. Do you know what waveform control is? A lot of things, motor control, um, even driving signals on an LED are all pulse width modulated. Do you know how to correctly set the waveform in the duty cycle, the frequency in the duty cycle? Direct memory access. So this is something I find lacking in a lot of uh, new engineers. Do you know what DMA is? DMA is the, a peripheral that simply moves memory from one spot of the system to another without intervention of the CPU. With the design challenges we have in Embedded, the processors are a heck of a lot faster than the memory peripherals nowadays. So this provides an asynchronous design challenge in terms of can you get memory from one spot of the system to the other without having the CPU having to wait on everything? And understanding a basic computer architecture. You can't program an embedded system with not knowing at least the basics of how it works underneath. What's the architecture that's being used? And how can it be used to its fullest potential? The hardware's there for a reason. You need to learn how to use it. And this is a huge one, how to debug. Things are going to go wrong when you start to implement a design. How can you figure out what you're doing it, and fix it? But not only, how are you confident that you've actually fixed it? You need to be able to use the tools at your disposal in order to figure this out. And have you played around with embedded projects before? So I'm looking for things like, I played around with Arduino projects. Uh, it's a hobbyist board, but it's a great start. Uh, interfacing with peripherals. If you've done a little bit more, things like the STM32 discovery kit, um, it, the professional evaluation kits, they're just around the same price as the Arduino, but they're a little bit more steep in terms of learning curve. And what did you actually do with them? Did you talk to peripherals? Even just getting code built and running on this thing is, is a, a challenge in and of itself, but I want to see somebody actually being able to interface with peripherals in a system. All right, let's talk about some design understanding. So why filter? This is the age old question uh, in most digital systems. You have to have some basic understanding of digital signal processing. Um, so things like what's the finite impulse response filter versus an infinite impulse response filter. Um, and this is really important, especially when you're talking about sampling things from an ADC. Do you have enough dynamic range in your ADC? What filtering are you using? And what is the hardware actually doing with it? Why should one serial protocol be used over another? Spoiler alert, it's not that they're all the same. That's the wrong answer. I squared C, SPY, and UART, and all other serial protocols have different hardware requirements in terms of timing and also uh, uh, arbitration on the bus. So you need to understand what your problem is and how to apply those and which one it fits best for your situation. Why use DMA? So primarily it's to offload the CPU like I mentioned before, but it's really to utilize the hardware to its fullest potential. If your CPU can be doing other things in your main control loop or your main control threads, 
that's probably a better option than moving memory from one spot to another. Why should you minimize instructions inside of an interrupt service routine? So this is really a, the, one of the fundamental principles of embedded computing. The processor will halt itself from main operation in your main control loop and go into an interrupt service routine to service whatever you need it to do. You want to minimize the amount of time it's in there because it could miss uh, very important timings in your main control loop. So you have to minimize the amount of instructions that are in the interrupt service routine and once it hits the memory exit address, it'll go back to your main control loop. Uh, another thing is design challenges are priority-based interrupts. If you have multiple interrupts that are firing at the same time, how do you prioritize each one of them over? SDM32 has something called the nested, ve or nested vectored interrupt controller, and it basically is a queue of a priority-based system, and if one uh, interrupt is going and another one is a higher priority, it supersedes and preemptively switches to that one. So you need to understand how to use all those uh, in order to fit your timing diagrams. Let's talk about the hardware. This is the most important part of embedded systems, in my opinion. You need to know what voltage dividers are. If you don't know that equation, get it in your brain. Understand how it's applied. These are used for everything. They're used to scale things on ADC pin inputs. They're used to uh, use on sensors. I mean, these are just used all over the place, and it's important to understand how they work. Pull-up versus pull-down resistor and configuration. So you have an external network of pull-up and pull-down resistors, and you also have an internal configuration of open drain and closed drain and also pull-up and pull-down that you need to understand how this chip is working as well as your external design. What hardware are you controlling? This is probably the most important part of this. Uh, typically, if you're driving something, if you're enabling something, you need to have the understanding of what's happening in real time, and this can be challenging, but you need to at least have the forethought to think about it. And what is the software actually doing? Is it switching something? Is it driving something, enabling or disabling? Or holding it something in reset? What are the implications of that control in the hardware? Can things happen that are adverse uh, with the system or with the hardware itself? Also, this is another one that people don't really think about, emissions. So radiated and conducted emissions are an important part of designing a product for any part of the world. The FCC in the United States is certainly one of those uh, regulating bodies. And sometimes you need certain special signal control in order to prevent unwanted or uh, with radi or unwanted or uh, signals of radiated and conducted emissions in order to pass, so you can actually sell your product in different parts of the world. So this is something to think about upfront as well. Let's talk a little bit about the tools you're going to be using to solve these problems. So you're going to be working in an, uh, some type of embedded uh, IDE, some integrated development environment. And these are some of the basics that you can find. So Keel or Kyle from ARM. Uh, or IAR Embedded Workbench, Code Warrior from Motorola Freescale and NXP. Uh, you have to understand how to use the real-time debugger with this stuff. You have to understand how to build a project. You know, that kind of, the basic stuff, how to operate with it. I just spent a lot of time in there. This is something I find very lacking in, in education, too, is real-time operating systems. So if you're in, interested in the embedded field and you want to do anything in, in this area, um, nowadays, everything's pretty much going to have an RTOS. So understand, you know, what is a thread? How to share thread or data between threads? Things like that. Uh, everything's statically allocated. Uh, so things like RTX from ARM, MicroCOS, or Free RTOS from Amazon are all different uh, operating systems you can get working with to understand how they work and the basis of it and how you can use these tools to solve your problems. Then there's things like performance profiling tools. So Micrium is a good example of this. It's hard to see what's going on inside of an embedded chip, but there's protocols that communicate back and forth about process information in real time. If you use something like Micrium, it can show you how much memory you're using, uh, what threads are active, how much percentage of the CPU you're using, uh, things like that stack usage and unwanted heap usage, things like that. It's important to know at least the basics of this stuff. And then just having some understanding of what JTAG and SWD are because they're protocols used for real-time debugging. Let's talk about the positive attitude and flexibility. So I heard this once and I like this saying, the IC of the day mentality. So you have to be willing to learn new technology and interface it with, it with it as a peripheral. Like I said, technology moves quickly in the embedded sphere. You need to be able to learn and understand how to use this stuff quickly. Uh, so you gotta be quick and effective in and out of a data sheet. You have to understand the pros and the cons. How does it fit in your design based on your requirements? You gotta be flexible. So parts can become obsolete even in the middle of development or they can run out of stock, like from what we've seen uh, recently with uh, chip shortages, and they need to be replaced. You have to be willing to throw out work that you spent weeks on and get started on something new if something like this comes up. And there's the case where designs can change even within the same requirements. Sometimes there's a cost basis reason or something along those lines. Technical know-how. So 
We're going to talk a little bit about what you would kind of expect in like a technical assessment, at least from what I typically look for. Uh, so implementation knowledge, putting the knowledge of these tools into action, engineering knowledge, so some methods of analysis uh, for the systematic review, and can you solve a problem? All right, so let's start with this. You know your stuff, so you've been to school, you've learned a little bit, now what? Can you put the knowledge to the test? So this is where the technical assessment is usually performed in an interview. And questions are based around the skills needed for the job. They're not going to ask you things that are totally off base. Example is, like we talked about before, do you know the difference between I squared C and UART? That's excellent. Great. What are the typical ways to implement a UART receive protocol? We'll go over an actual practical example of this later. Biggest challenges of real-time high-speed data handling. So sometimes the speed at which the data is required is faster than a lot of the processing speed you've got. How can you handle that? Um, these are the questions I'm looking for when uh, somebody has asked this question. Can you effectively identify the engineering trade-offs? So what do I mean by that? So let's talk about a current sensor, for example. I'm looking for questions like, what's the sampling rate of the ADC that's coming from the, the current sensor? How, how quickly can I get this in? What's the Nyquist frequency of the filter that they're using? Things like that. These tools of analysis are, it, it are very important, and you need to be able to identify these tools and how to identify these trade-offs. So, like, do you need to filter what kind, IAR, FIR, what are the differences between the two for frequency response, uh, what is the phenomenons that you see in, in typical frequency responses, things like that. All right, so now we'll get into some technical interview questions that I, I've asked in the past. So if you're, if you're doing embedded, you have to know C and C++ very well. There's no way around that. Um, there's no other languages that are being used right now uh, in terms of these tools that are better. Some examples, so let's say you have assembly in C++ uh, and C on your resume is proficient. I would expect you to be able to translate from assembly to C and C to assembly fairly reasonably. Not perfect, but at least understand what's going on. Can you handle pointers? Pointers are probably the, the fundamental principle of embedded programming. So let's look at this basic example. So I have a signed 32-bit array here of 16 elements. I have two variables I throw on the stack, or two pointers I throw on the stack here. The first one is set to the ninth element of this array, and the second one is set to the first element of this array. What's the difference between these two? Yeah, anybody, anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> no, good guess, but it's actually eight. And this seems really confusing, but let me break it down a little bit further. So what the compiler is going to do is it's going to compute an offset between these two um, array addresses. So it's just going to take the difference of the addresses of the ninth element minus the first element. That's 256 bytes, because this is four bytes each, since we're uh, 32 bits. But the type we're using for the pointers to take the difference is four bytes apiece. So we need to divide that by 32, which is the size of the pointer, uh, of the pointer type subtracted, and then we get eight. So that's what you can expect to, to see, uh, questions like this. This is a basic enough question, but it shows understanding of pointer arithmetic. Here's one that's a little more challenging, and this is one that I actually use in our code base quite a lot, this multiple indirective statement. So let's say we have a byte array here of eight elements. So it's initialized to this in memory here, and then I throw a 64-bit variable on the stack. I use uh, the 64-bit variable here with this multiple indirective statement. So essentially what we're doing here is we're taking array and treating it as a 64-bit variable type. It's going to set it to the, the point or the address which it points to in the type of a 64-bit variable. Then we're going to take the contents of that and assign it to test. So what is the answer to this? Well, it's, it's actually a trick question. It depends. And this is what I look for, what people uh, will uh, see and ask questions about. So let's think about this a little bit further. If we're in a 64-bit architecture, bus reads and writes to memory are usually going to be 64 bits long. So this means that it will be in the exact order that you see in this array initialized. But what happens when the bit size goes below 64 bits? The bus starts to need to um, split up reads and writes. So it really depends on what's your architecture, little endian or big endian. If it's little endian, these bottom four bytes are going to get flipped to the, le or the least significant are going to move to the most and most to least. Or if it's 16 bits, it, it's going to be two apiece. They're each going to be flip-flopped. So using these clues, you can kind of piece together uh, what, this, what this is, and you can reason about it technically. And also, it demonstrates you can reason about something, and also you know what you're using in terms of tools. OK, so let's talk about some engineering analysis. So use of statistics and probability. Let's say you have a one-dimensional signal. So this, in this case, is just going to be current. You want to detect a unit step function. 
uh, based on some ADC samples for a current sensor. And this will change the current state to the next state of your state machine. So here's what the current would actually look like in real time. So even after it's filtered, it's still pretty jagged and it's really difficult to be able to tell and make decisions on this in real time. So this is the challenge you're up against. So the way I look at it is how would you approach this for analysis? It's purposefully open-ended. So you have to ask a lot of questions. So a few key questions I look for. First of all, what are the tech specs of the processor? You need to be able to know what kind of computations you can run on the processor. Do I need floating point? Does it have a floating point coprocessor? If not, I need to use fixed point, things like that. What's the ADC sampling rate? A 500 hertz ADC sampling rate is gonna be much different than that of a 1500 hertz sampling rate. What, are the, what type of hardware and software filtering is done to the signal? So there's gonna be some hardware filtering coming in for emissions purposes, but also there might even be some bandpass filters uh, in order to remove noise and things like that, depending on what, uh, where your system is in the, in the actual circuit design. And this is a huge one. What relationship does the current have to the system? I mean, we're not just looking at this for no reason. There's a requirement that's driving this need. Maybe current has some, uh, a transient spike of current has some relational uh, piece to the temperature of the system and you need to shut it down. How do you know uh, how current relates to temperature? This requires further analysis and testing. And you can even run difference of mean tests or something like that in software uh, to figure out like if you reject the null hypothesis or not, you can determine whether or not the state needs to transition. And that's, it comes down to how do you determine that statistical significance? You need to find a relationship by doing experiments and other things like that. Make sure you can demonstrate an understanding of how to apply analysis to solve a problem. This is just a basic example. This can be done in hundreds of different ways. All right, so now we'll get something a little more fun. So this is more problem solving. I'll ask an open-ended design question. Design a video game controller. First question I look for is what are my requirements? What do I need to do? So in this case, you need to sample inputs. You need a way of transmitting from controller to console so the console can actually use it in real time for the game. You need to determine if a button's pressed or not. Every switch is gonna have a little mechanical contact that bounces electrically and it's not gonna be a perfect one-dimensional signal uh, step function. So you need to have a way of debouncing whether that's software or hardware. So can you identify these challenges? So how can I process the inputs but then also transmit it to the console at the same time. What's the correct amount so the player feels like they're actually doing something? And then the switch and analog stick to bouncing. You're gonna get rampant values. How can I filter that? How can I debounce it? So let's talk a little bit about the summary of the, of the skills here. So solid fundamentals. You need to understand the basics of embedded, serial protocols, waveform control, everything we talked about. Practice embedded projects by yourself. This is big. It doesn't, it doesn't cost that much. Spend some money, buy a breadboard, put your nose to the grindstone and start learning. This is the best way to get involved with embedded systems. Understand the basics of embedded design. Know your hardware, this is very important. We'll talk about that with data-oriented design in a minute. And understand your tools. Tools are used to solve the problem. You shouldn't be excited about the tools, you should be excited about what you build with the tools. So understand them well and know how to build things with them. Have a positive attitude and passion about embedded and have that technical know-how at least a little bit. This is very important. And you have to be able to demonstrate the knowledge of the tools that you know in a meaningful way. And show that you can stitch together tool knowledge, design practices, and engineering analysis together to solve a problem. All right, now we're gonna get into the fun stuff. So this is intro to data-oriented uh, design for embedded systems. So data-oriented design, I'm gonna go over the origins of it, the theory behind it, the applications. So let's talk where it began. So let's, what is it? And why the heck do we care about it on embedded systems? So data-oriented design is basically, uh, it was in, the practices of it have been practiced for many years, but it was officially coined sometime in the mid-2000s. So right around the time of the PS3, when the cell architecture came out from IBM with the power PC, it became very difficult to use object-oriented design principles to utilize the hardware to its fullest potential. There were many game developers that created some type of general guidelines and rules of systematic analysis of how to maximize your use of the hardware, and it's designed particularly around the data that you're using. So data-oriented design in a nutshell from what I can pick up is just the organization of data for efficient processing on your custom embedded hardware architecture. So this is the maximum, it's the whole point of it is to maximize the utilization of the hardware. Hardware is the platform, software is never the platform. You use the hardware. How is it applicable to embedded systems? So the point of a program, if you think about it, the point of a computer program is to transform data from one form to another. 
And at some point, maybe if you're lucky, that data can actually do something. The only thing we care about in embedded systems is this transformation of data to invoke action, whether that's on real hardware or internally. That's why this matters. By nature, we should think along these lines. How can we maximize the use of the hardware? How can I be the most efficient as possible? So let's talk a little bit more about why we should care. Embedded systems are very time and hardware constrained. So time constrained not only in terms of project timeline, but also in terms of servicing. You need to serve peripherals in the correct amount of time in order for things to be, uh, a system to be well oiled. And the hardware is limited. You don't have the, the ability to use 12 gigs of RAM. You have maybe a few hundred bytes at some points in older processors. We care about how the system behaves holistically. So particularly with safety, um, if the system behaves and it interacts with people, you can potentially hurt somebody or you can lose a ton of money, like blow up a rocket. We care about how the system behaves, so we wanna make sure we get all of this right, all the hardware and the processing done correctly. We care about resources. With everything going battery powered nowadays, the amount of instructions and the amount of time your processor is active really matters. So we need to be able to utilize the hardware to its fullest potential so we can stop processing and go to sleep. We care about launching a product on time, and I'm not just talking about kicking it across the finish line, I'm talking about making a good, coherent product that actually does what it says it's supposed to. And we care about performance. This is something that people get hypersensitive about sometimes, but it's true. We do care about how things perform, whether it's how fast it goes or how much power it uses. These are very important things we care about. And this is why data-oriented design really is driven home in embedded systems. Most designs have major hard timing deadlines. So let's talk about the difference between a hard timing deadline and a soft timing deadline. Soft timing deadline would be on a video game if you have, let's say you're shooting for 30 FPS, or, or we'll do 60 FPS. You have 16.666 milliseconds to get all your physics calculations done, your translations done, before you shove it into the frame buffer and have it display on screen. That's a soft timing deadline, because if you miss that timing deadline, it just results in dropped frames. So it's stuttering in the games, and while it's inconvenient, it's not gonna detriment the entire system. An example of a hard timing deadline is going to be an airbag. Think about this. Let's say the airbag deploys too late. Well, you're in trouble because a person's face is gonna be right at the, the point of attack and it potentially could kill them. If it deploys too early, it won't be able to decrease the impulse which decreases force to pr uh, protect them uh, you know, completely. So you need to make sure that these hard timing deadlines are serviced no matter what. The whole system has to come to a halt upon these hard timing deadlines. So you can't be caught somewhere else doing some other data processing when these things pop up. Depending on the application, like I said, if you miss your update window, something seriously sinister can happen. And this is really a big piece of it too. So there's more complicated memory hierarchies now in embedded systems with faster CPUs. So it, embedded faces an issue similar to what we saw in the mid to late 2000s of computing systems where processors' speeds are increasing dramatically, but memories are not. All right, so let's frame the discussion. So before we start talking about practical examples, let's look at the architecture in question. So it's gonna be ARM, but we're gonna talk about the V7 instruction set. So the microcontroller is the STM32H7, the 23Z variant. It's unbelievable what they can do with chips these days. It fits in a nice little die package. You have an M7 core with 550 megahertz clock, 32 kilobytes of L1 cache, 32 kilobytes of an instruction cache. You have a floating point coprocessor, 432 kilobytes of RAM. Now, this also has other special DSP coprocessors, things like that, we're not gonna focus on that for now. And it's also got one megabyte of embedded flash memory. All right, so let's look at what ARM is designed to do. So ARM cores are specifically designed to be run from the cache as much as possible. And why is that? ARM has very strict memory alignment procedures, meaning that uh, reads and writes from the memory peripherals need to be aligned directly on what the bit size of the architecture is in order for this to be efficiently processed. And this means memory usage is extremely imperative. Uh, ARM also has something called tightly coupled memory or TCM, and it's accessed every cycle. It's actually faster than the cache. So something you can do to speed your program up a little bit, uh, traditionally in ARM you want to avoid using the stack as much as possible, but if you put your stack in TCM it at least helps a little bit. This is the performance uh, processor memory gap I was talking about. So as you can see in the 80s, they were about even, but as time rolled on, the pro our processor development uh, for R&D was funded a lot more than memory. Uh, because that's what the market needed. So this is, this is why using uh, caches and things like that are very important nowadays in order to get the most use out of your system because you're dealing with memory accesses that are much slower than what the processor can actually run at. So you'll be wasting a lot of time otherwise. All right, so for a little bit of a data visualization here, visualization aid, 
Let's look at and see what it looks like in real time or scaled uh, to access L1 versus main memory. So that's L1, that's pretty quick, right? Here's main memory. So as we can see, it's pretty slow. Uh, it's typically about 100 times slower on average uh, in most systems. But this is why the use of the cache is extremely important. The more we can fit in there on the cache lines, the more we have hot data in the cache, the easier we can get the data back and processed. I'm not gonna let you sit through that whole thing, but also another thing is that it's 50 to 60 times more energy to access main memory. So if you're interested in power consumption usage, which you should be nowadays, this is extremely important. So we wanna use the cache as much as possible. So data-oriented design kind of aids tools in this area. Instructions count. So the fewer the instructions you execute, the less energy you can actually expel. So the sooner you can go to sleep, the more power you can save. This kind of conforms to the idea of the risk uh, processor design philosophy. So originally, the idea was that analysis was done on most other architectures showing that there's so many instructions to do a number of different things, they could conf uh, or make them a concise instruction set list, but more instructions could be called to do work, and this results in a, uh, a smaller instruction set. However, if you compare, it's typically around one instruction per cycle with most pipeline processors nowadays. The best of both worlds is if you can use a risk uh, design or processor and minimize the amount of instructions that you're using. Because at that point, like you said, if I can get in one millisecond, if I can get all the processes I need or done and then go to sleep for 99 milliseconds, we're talking about the difference of current draw of microamps uh, per hour at sleep versus uh, milliamps per hour. So that's like a factor of three. So the most you can get done in the littlest amount of time. All right, so Mike Acton is a video game developer. I believe he works at Unity now. And uh, he is a, if you, have, if you haven't heard of data-oriented design, uh, or if you have heard of it, you've heard about his name. He's a big proponent of it. He's got what's called the three big lies of software engineering, and I think they're very applicable to embedded systems. Lie number one is that software is the platform. No, it isn't. Uh, you don't put software on software. Software doesn't run on hopes and dreams. It runs on real hardware. This is something that's really important to understand. And this is something that the object-oriented design principle kind of fundamentally pretends that the hardware doesn't exist. We don't want to do that. That is a terrible idea in embedded systems. Code should be designed around a model of the world. Once again, another object-oriented principle type of, of teaching, things like pet has you know, subclasses of dog, cat. Code should not be designed around a model of the world because what you can be doing is implementing things that can potentially cause more problems for yourself. It, the real hardware doesn't always conform to a real world model and simulation. Code is more important than data. So code is pretty disposable. Like I said, Technology changes quickly. You can't just port code over from one processor to another. It's a totally different system. Code needs to be rewritten anyway. Code is a tool to solve a problem. Nothing more, nothing less. You need to be able to use the tool to its maximum abilities in order to make sure you fit the requirements of your design. But it's not solving code problems, it's solving engineering problems. We're hired as engineers, we're not hired as code, it, just people that write code all day long. This is something really important to understand. The don'ts of embedded programming. Okay, avoid the use of exceptions. So for those who use C++ or C Sharp or what, Java, never use exceptions. We have a finite space of memory. Exceptions can balloon the space in memory usage and you end up in a hard fault and your whole system crashes. Uh, exceptions are heavily, heavily uh, frowned upon. Just use a custom error handling system you can implement yourself. They're simple to use and they're much, much more memory efficient. Why use an if? Be purposeful with your if statements. I'm not telling you not to use if statements, but the reason behind this is because branch prediction is helpful. There's a lot of really nice hardware on processors to do branch prediction, but the time in the case of a misprediction can't be made up. So if you have the ability to do conditional statements versus branching instructions, do that. Don't use malloc, at least not the, the typical implementation that you're gonna come custom. You need to write your own custom allocation tools. And usually it's not just gonna be one that does it all, it's gonna be multiple that do certain things very well. With malloc you can get a lot of fragmentation that you have no control over and you can end up once again hard faulting because you're out of memory. At least with custom allocators you can control in sandbox and in pools and blocks of how much you actually need. No recursion, ever. Never, ever, ever even think about this word in terms of embedded processing. Uh, we care about stack usage. Every time you call a function, a new stack frame gets populated on the stack and it keeps growing. Someone once told me, sure, you can use it in embedded, but not for anything useful. And that's 100% the case. You're gonna run out of memory real fast. 
avoid the use of templates. So templates cripple compile times. They balloon out the amount of time it takes to build the project. Typically, you're not going to need the use of templates in Embedded anyway, but if you can find a use for it, that's good, okay. But it's typically frowned upon. This is strongly suggest suggested by me. If you're using C++, don't use multiple inheritance. So this has a, a, a plethora of problems to it. It, in my opinion, forces poor programming habits, for one. It's not purposeful. C++ is one of the only languages that allows you to inherit multiple classes from one another. And the big part is that minimal iCache control. When you use multiple inheritance and implement virtual functions, it creates what's called a V table. And it's basically just an array of function pointers in memory somewhere. This is all at the mercy of the compiler. If you're interested in maximizing your instruction cache usage, you want to make sure your instructions are closely, tightly coupled in memory. This, we'll talk about the, the locality of reference later. But what this does is it basically is jumping all over memory, so you can't really utilize your iCache as much as you want. And in the case of the SDM32H7 that uses Harvard architecture with multiple or two different buses for data and instructions, this is, uh, the instruction cache is extremely uh, useful, especially for prefetching instruction counts. So if it's all over the place, it can't predict that. The do's of embedded programming. You have to design code to minimize pipeline interlocks. So if you've all heard of pipeline stalls, all processors are pipeline nowadays. You have to be mindful of how the compiler generates instructions. Every compiler is different. Sometimes it can help you in this area, but the compiler can only really reason about 10% of your problems. So if you understand how it generates instructions, you can kind of even just look at it before you code and take a look at the output and say, okay, I have a good idea. You can learn to minimize stalls this way. Locality of reference. So all the computer engin engineers in the house here can, can scream uh, happy joy or joyful uh, rejoices here. Use the cache. Spatial and temporal locality are extremely important when you're designing uh, code in C and C++. Learn how to work with your compiler. It's a tool. It's not a magic wand, in the words of Mike Acton. Saying the compiler will solve your problems is not an excuse to be lazy. Um, it, your compiler can only really reason it, with how complicated memory hierarchies are. Compilers are programmed to be maximum paranoia. It needs to make sure that things don't change here and there so your stuff doesn't get ruined. Every compiler is different. It can only solve a small percentage of your problems. Don't let the compiler will take care of it be an excuse to be lazy. Be purposeful with your engineering. What are your requirements? How do, this affects how your data is going to be driven and how your design will be formed as a result. How should I use code to implement the design? You should do the design first, the code second. The code is the tool to solve the problem. All right, let's talk about how to use it. So have a plan, for one. Structured requirements drive data. Data drives design. Structure your data around the hardware. And understand what instructions you need to process. All my digital communication folks in the house can understand this a little bit better. You can even calculate the Shannon entropy. You can dump the data and look at all the instructions. Figure out the minimal amount of information that you need to, in order to do the same amount of work. Understand what instructions you need to process and learn the architecture you need to learn or, or that you're using in order to characterize the performance. So the most probable data to be accessed and used and the most probable instructions to be clocked. If you have a better understanding of this, you can write code in a more efficient manner in order to utilize the hardware as much as possible. And then finally, you gotta devise a strategy. So when you come up with a plan, you need to get a strategy to actually get this thing working. So you need to understand what you need to implement in terms of timing, figure out how to schedule and meet these timing deadlines, and use tools like a real-time operating system in order to aid in scheduling. So let's talk about the cache. Typically, you want to use structures of arrays. Uh, why is that? Because arrays are cache-friendly. They're stored in row major order. They're contiguously stored in memory. You need to try to structure data in such that it conforms with the cache lines. So in this case, on the H7, we've got the, or the M7's got a 32-byte cache line, two-way set associative cache on both the instruction and data. So you need to have it fit in there to make it make sense to have the most hot data in the cache at all times. You have to optimize for temporal and spatial locality. Temporal's in time, spatial's in space. If things are tightly coupled in memory in space, you optimize your spatial locality. If they're accessed around the same time, temporal locality. You have to prevent cache line eviction at all costs. Let's say you're slightly misaligned, all the stuff goes out of the cache. We don't want that. Understand the associativity, the capacity, and the rules of each cache that you're using. These are all gonna be very important of how you can actually write code to optimize for this. Make sure that the data you use is often and aligned to the cache size, temporal and spatial locality. All right, so let's look at some, some real examples here. 
So this first example is how you, t so key value pairing in programming. This is pretty common, especially with things like linked lists or binary search trees, right? Here's one way to do it. You have two separate arrays. Both of these are 50 words long, so this means that they're 50 words apart. This is not very spatially, or uh, this is not optimized for spatial locality. Why? Because key and value are used together. So this means they're 50 words apart, they don't conform to the cache line. With this, it's much better. If you put them close in memory, that's what a structure will do, you can actually have these put together. And at this point, now you can have things optimized for spatial locality, and in your operations, you can use it for temporal. All right, let's talk about a real design example in embedded systems. So let's talk about a UART receive interface. So we're working at 115.2 baud rate here. So this means that 100 and every second, 115,200 bits are sent across the line. That's how fast it's running. We have eight data bits, one stop bit, no parity. We need to initialize the data in order to get it running. This is what it would look like using CubeMX and the HAL from ST, for example. This is what I used. There's, oh, one last thing I want to say. There's other things like bubble logic for hardware flow control. So if you have a system that's fast and needs to be processed and you want to minimize overrun, hardware flow control is a great way of doing that. And then oversampling is great if you don't want to use perfect filtering on the hardware in the front. Okay, so here's a, here's a big thing. What does this thing actually need to do? What are our requirements? So we need, to able, we need to be able to understand messages coming in from a custom UART frame table. We must be able to change states based on, the op, based on an opcode table from the frames that come in. We must be able to respond to the appropriate messages that need to, uh, to be responded to. So let's take a look at where to start. Can we use the DMA? So processing at 115.2 baud is slow. If we can use the DMA to take it from the RX peripheral and shove it in memory somewhere and asynchronously look on the update loop, it's probably our best bet. But let's say in this case all the DMA channels are used up. So this is a design that's really, really close and knocking on the ceiling of the processor. So this means we need to minimize the amount of overhead as much as possible for the CPU. Let's talk about interrupt-based RX receive. So every byte coming into the UART peripheral will invoke an interrupt. An interrupt service routine, we need a way to, uh, to move those bytes into memory quickly and effectively. Like I said, we want to spend as least amount of time inside the interrupt service routine. So how will this be handled? And how can the application actually take that data, parse it, and take action? All right, so we need a way to quickly process the bytes coming in during an interrupt service routine, and bytes come from the peripheral one at a time in order. So we can characterize the performance, and we notice that move and add instructions in the ARM architecture are primarily what are going to be used here, since we're moving bytes around. So what data structure should you use? Well, typical computer science theory will tell you a linked list. That is the wrong answer, and here's why. The good old linked list is not only not cache friendly, it grows too big, potentially. Each node may not be, uh, be near or, uh, each other in memory, and in the case of doubly, it could be both, and it ju can jump all over the place. This isn't good for spatial or temporal locality, so, and you have to traverse through each element in order to get to the spot you want. What about a FIFO queue? Absolutely. So a FIFO queue, imagine you're standing in line at a gas station. You come up to the counter first. You are serviced first. The people behind you are serviced next in order. That is the same principle we can use for bytes coming in for a UART peripheral. We have limited memory, though, so we need to, and we need to optimize it for our spatial and temporal locality so that the cache can be used to its fullest potential and we can get in and out of that interrupt service routine. So we do what's called a circular buffer. So the whole point of a circular queue is you have a finite arena of memory here. Usually, in this case, it's going to be an array. Once again, we don't want to use linked lists here. We want to use an array because you can access any element at any time. Once new bytes get added uh, to the empty space, it increments the tail, and on the application is going to service the head. It's going to pull what came first and put it in memory. And once you get to the end of this, you wrap around to the beginning again, and you can compute the offset in real time so that it's treated as one long system, but you're only using a finite space of memory. Here's how that would work. So this is how we start. In this case, our elements are zero. The head and the tail are exactly at the same spot in memory. When we put something onto the queue, the new byte gets added to the byte zero location, and then the tail moves over to byte one. When we add another element, the same thing happens here. The tail goes to byte two, there's two bytes in the queue. In, instead of using variables to determine the elements, you can just take the difference of address using pointers. Let's say we want to get something from the queue. The tail's at byte two, 
it starts to remove the head and put it into memory in order at which it came in until the head reaches the tail. At this point, we know everything's empty and we're ready to go. So this seems a little complicated. So it might take a lot of code to design. Well, not really. I did it in about 20 lines here. It's really simple. What I did was I created a struct here with the queue of the array itself and the head and the tail. Then what I did was uh, for the put, all I did was created a pointer, use that pointer var variable as the new FIFO member, and I checked to see if I'm at the end of the queue. If I am, I wrap back around. To get the FIFO, I checked to see if it's full or if it's at the same spot in memory, meaning there's nothing in the queue. If there's something there, I just pop the head off using a pointer, and then if I need to wrap around, I can do that as well. So basically, these are also forced inline, so there's no epilogue and prologue code. So it's just like basically instructions that are executed. I also have to think about cacheability here. So what I did was I set the maximum queue size to the byte of a ca or to the size of the cache line, which is 32 bytes. And I also aligned this in memory because of these two 8-bit pointers here, so that it can all fit on two cache lines. This will be blazing fast and it, this example I've used for a personal project of mine for remote upgrading via UART. This works extremely well. Hasn't failed yet. All right, let's talk about the actual interrupt service routine now. So every time we want to put something into the FIFO, that's when we get the, uh, from, the, from the UART peripheral, but we, then we need to reissue the receive command. So we're going to look for something else. So as long as you can process these fast, uh, faster than your uh, baud rate, you're in good shape. And with the processor speed we got, that's totally fine. All right, let's talk about designing a frame table. So these, the messages that you send, you can't just send bytes over and expect the other side to understand without having some knowledge. You need to design a frame table. So the way I did it is I have a caution byte that basically says if I get an FA in hex coming across the, uh, the line, it tells the parser, look for a message. I then get the length and the opcode. So the length is going to be how big the message is as a whole for the checksum calculation. I don't want to just read things willy-nilly and have stuff be controlled. We need to have some type of uh, error detection scheme. And in some cases, you might even have error correction or erasure detection uh, inside this messaging protocol to make sure that the payload and the opcode is exactly what you designed it to be in the first place. And this is my opcode table for the bootloader that I designed on one of my personal projects. So it's basically just all the different messages that can potentially be sent across this line. That being said, we need to implement a finite state machine for the UART handler. So you're going to start at the idle state, where you're just waiting for bytes to come in. If I get a caution byte, I move to the caution state. The handshake pending state is checking the checksum to make sure that all the extra st or all the, the message is correct. Then we can go into the opcode receive state, where we actually call the opcode handler to do something based on the message. And then if we need to retransmit a message, there's also a state to do that as well. And then if there's any cleanup we need to do afterwards, we're good there. There's also error handling as well, uh, in, and retries if necessary. OK, so what does the application need to do? It needs to take the bytes from the data structure from the interrupt at receive and actually put it into some area we can use in memory. So simply here, I could just take the difference of the FIFO head and tail, and if there's a difference, I know that there's bytes in the queue. And at this point, I can just assign them to an array locally. And then I have a received bytes index to show how far along we are. Each message is defined in a structure. So we have the data, or the data and the frame size. So this way, everything is easily cacheable. We can understand how to use this. And we can use this length for the checksum calculation. Here's what the state machine looks like in C. So right here, I poke the RX queue to figure out if there's any new bytes first. Then, depending on the state we're in, we'll call these functions to do so. And then I also have a watchdog here to make sure we're not in any one state for too long. Otherwise, we reset the whole state machine and go back to the idle state. Or we'll go to the stall state, wait for a certain amount of time, and then go to the idle state or the error state. All right, so here's what we do. We wait for the caution byte. Remember I said, uh, why use an if? Here's a great example. I'm checking to see if the first byte is the caution byte. I'm not using an if statement here. I'm using a conditional multiplied by the actual state. So if it's 0, everything goes to 0. It's not true. If it's 1, it's multiplied by 1. So the caution state, we can advance to the next one. If it's greater than the opcode index, meaning we've received an opcode, we can decode this opcode and move to the checksum calculation. After the checksum has been uh, actually verified, we can move to the opcode received. 
and then look in the opcode table. The way I did this is I had an array of function pointers here for opcodes, and I had callbacks associated with each function. So each action for the state machine will be determined through these callback functions based on the opcode that comes in. And once again, why use an if? We can just use a conditional to figure out if the opcode's actually in the table. All right, I know I'm jumping around a lot here, but this is the last example. Let's talk about video games a little bit. So let's say we're on the Nintendo 64 and we see this piece of code. This is actually something I've seen before and I'll show you my solution to it in a bit. So looking at this, there's nothing intrinsically wrong about it. It looks fine, it's just there's a lot of stuff going on here for something pretty simple. So really what this function is supposed to do on a high level is it takes the floating point sign of, of y and moves it into x. And you can see here, there's a couple of branching instructions here that will then return x if it's positive, um, minus x if it's negative, or otherwise return x. So why is this a problem? So let's talk about the Nintendo 64 for a second. It's a 64-bit MIPS processor. It's the VR4300. It's actually a, a stripped-down version called the VR4300i. So why is this a problem? So this might be hard to read, but I'll explain here. So in the data sheet for the VR4300, first of all, if you're branching, you're incurring a, a propagation delay of at least one clock cycle to use the branching circuitry. At that point, if the branch address is miscalculated, you're also delaying another three clock cycles to figure out where to go, and you've stalled the entire pipeline for at least those four cycles. If you're unlucky, and there's an instruction uh, translational look-aside buffer miss, this means that the branch instruction was uh, decoded incorrectly from the page table, and it was incorrectly uh, calculated. You can incur what's called a multiple cycle delay, where you can end up almost at 30 cycles at scale. You're sitting with the processor totally stalled. And this matters when you're programming video games. So what it ends up is, is you have poor branch locality. The cache can't be used that much because of all the reissuing uh, re of the addresses. You have a very high probability of pipeline interlock. And you have a high chance of misprediction based on all the different options you've got here. So let's think about how we can solve this using a data-oriented mindset. So let's figure out what we're actually trying to solve here. So let's look at the IEEE 754 floating point standard as a whole. Right here in the first 30-second uh, bit, we've got the sign bit, we've got the exponent bits after that, and then the mantissa, which is the fraction of the, of the floating point number. So if we notice here, there's something blatantly obvious, the sign bit. All we're doing is taking one sign and copying it to another, right? We don't care about the rest of this stuff. So that's what we're solving. Let's look at the data. We can take that sign bit, why not, we need one bit of information to solve our problem, let's just copy that sign from that floating point number and store it into the other. This provides a bit of a problem though, so here's my solution to this problem. This provides a bit of a problem because floating point registers in the floating point coprocessor use different registers than say just unsigned or signed registers. So we have to use our friend multiple indirection in order to solve this problem. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a temporary 32-bit variable because a float is 32 bits long. What I'm doing is I'm using multiple indirection on the address of the float to convert it to a 32-bit integer. This large coefficient is just taking the 32nd bit of y, and then we're oring it while clearing the 32nd bit of x into x and storing it in temp. Then we're returning that as a float. So we're taking that and generating instructions to put it back into a floating point register. So ideally, this is perfect. Branching is gone. There's nothing faster in terms of instructions than exclusive OR and, and everything else like that. Logic functions are always better than any type of branching. Why use more data or information when you, when you can use less? Simplest, the simplest solutions are always the best in this case. A speed up does occur at scale here. If you don't have any branch mispredictions or pipeline interlocks, you won't have any with this unless you're using the same registers, which I chose these carefully so you won't a speed up will definitely occur at scale. And there's no functional difference to programmers. They're still gonna use the same exact thing. They'll call it and it'll return the correct variable. And this is architecture independent as well. This works very well on ARM too. All right, I know I talked about a lot, but <laughs> let me try and summarize here. So you gotta understand your hardware. Understand what you're using, understand how to utilize it to the uh, best of your abilities, and also what your data conforms to. Memory and instruction and usage matters. This is really important because you need to understand how it's all 
functionally laid out, and also you need to utilize the memory correctly in order to minimize your power and uh, time usage. Let the requirements of your design drive the data and let the data drive your design. Approach problems less from a code perspective and more from a data perspective. Code is just something you use to solve the problem. I'll keep saying that over and over again. Your data is what will drive your design and figure out how to effectively move it around the architecture correctly. Engineers use code as a tool to solve a problem. Don't create more problems for yourself for the sake of conforming to a world model of your own code. Be purposeful in your engineering. Ask to yourself, why am I adding or removing the code? Uh, there should be a distinct need for it. And also, don't spend your whole day aligning equal signs on a page. That provides no value. Make sure you're purposeful and requirements driven. The end. Thank you, everybody. All right, so at this time, I'll take some questions and uh, feel free to follow me on YouTube as well as if you're interested in any other questions, reach out to my business email. I'll be happy to respond. Yes, sir. Later on, Yeah. So that's a very good question. So STM32 Cube IDE right now is built off the Eclipse platform. So typically that's a little more sluggish because once again, we're talking about the same problem. We're trying to force everything to conform to this model of Eclipse, right? To run across all platforms. So the reason I think it's not as viable of an option, at least at first, it's good if you're, yeah, sure, if you want to get started, that's great. Uh, but it's not mature enough yet. It's still starting off. I think in the next couple of years, it'll be better. So Code Warrior is a good example of using Eclipse and it being nice and robust. But I think the Cube IDE is still kind of in its infancy, or at least in the beginning. So we'll give it some time, but that's a very good question. Uh, and if you're starting out, that is something perfect to use because it's free. And it integrates with uh, STM32 CubeMX as well. So good question. Come on, there's got to be some more. I didn't ruffle anyone else's feathers. No? All right, well, feel free to reach out to my business email. And this presentation, if I went too fast for you guys, I talk quickly, will be on YouTube as well sometime within the next few days. So you can see and you can pause and see my presentation and slides and everything like that. All righty, thank you, everybody.